Welcome back to the Fantasy Hockey Podcast, the Sleepers episode. We're excited for this one. This is probably the most anticipated one of the year, aside from the busts episode, which is coming after this, where people just roast us because they disagree with our takes. Usually it's because we're picking your favorite player to be a bust, or you already had a draft and we pick your player as a bust. There's also other reasons why. We'll get into that in the actual busts episode, but this is the sleepers episode. So what we focus on in this episode are the people in later rounds that you should be paying attention to that are either going way too late and are being slept on, or there's also the situation where there's guys that are going really late, but they have a lot of upside potential and are worth a gamble a little bit earlier on. So that's what we focus on in this episode. Now, before we jump into it, a few quick uh, things real quick. So we're going to be, if you missed it, we did a mock draft, um, and that is on YouTube. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, be sure to check out our YouTube, uh, fantasyhockeypodcast.com, or you can go to YouTube and just search Fantasy Hockey Podcast. We'll come up, um, and you can go watch our first mock draft that we did in a standard Yahoo Cats. Uh, I drafted from the 11th position. Brandon drafted from the 7th. Now, we're going to be doing mock drafts quite a bit here leading up to the season. So if you want to be in one, we'll post them in our Discord or on Twitter. Uh, uh, patrons and YouTube members do get priority and YouTube members and patrons also get a special discord channel to where they can get uh, custom answers from us. And the, that's the channel we prioritize once things get really crazy and we're also busy with work. We always make sure to get back to those as soon as we can um, and give you customized advice there. So that's one perk. And also if you want to be in a listener league with us, it's getting pretty close to the date. So Jan one right now, is the date that we've set for the cutoff to join um, Patreon or become a YouTube member to be in a league with us. Um, and that's a lot of fun. And you can listen to the episodes live while we record them, which normally is about a day or two before they go out. So sometimes you might get a few uh, pickup suggestions before anybody else hears about them. So there are some cool perks there. Uh, there was one other thing I think I was going to mention, but I forgot. I think that's it. I don't think we really need to plug anything else. Um, sorry to have to do that. But, you know, if people want to play in a listener league with us, I think it's uh, kind of an important thing to get out there before the deadline hits. So let's jump into the sleepers. This year, what we did, we did a little bit differently. Last year, we just kind of ran down a list and no thought on positions. This year, we actually separated out by position. So we have forward sleepers, defenseman sleepers, and goaltender sleepers. So without further ado, Brandon, how about you run us through your first forward sleeper? Sure. So <clears throat> I've actually got three on my list, oddly enough, that are less than 180p currently on yahoo uh typically i don't do that because like that's not really a sleeper in the strictest terms but i think there's a few players that i just don't quite understand why they're not being drafted higher and i think in most sharp leagues they will be drafted higher so there's somebody you need to keep your eye on um i'll start with the, actually I'm, I'm gonna pick two straight up off the top here because they're on the same team brad marchand at 27.7 adp and david pasternak at oh, 43.1 yeah. Um, Marchand, there's, there's, hopefully he doesn't need an introduction at this point. He's been playing the best hockey of his career as he's gotten later in his career, which is unusual, but it's just what's been happening with him. Um, he's one of the highest point getters in the league. If you're in a PIMS league, he gets a huge bonus because he's, he's really big on PIMS as well. Um, big power play point guy. Um, uh, if, if he didn't have this injury designation on him, he would be going probably exactly where he was last season, which is at the end of the first round. Um, we're seeing this is a third round draft value for even in a 12 person league um, right now, which is crazy. He should never, he should not make it to the third round in any draft right now. Um, if you can get him early second, that'd be great. He's actually still worth a late first to me, but you know, that is, that is what it is, I guess. You're just willing to take on that um, risk. And then with Pasternak, yeah, there's not even a risk because he's, he, I mean, unless they've updated his, his status, he's supposed to be ready to go game sure. one. So it's, it's crazy. Um, but Pashnak is the risk. You're, you're going to lose a month ish of his value. If you take him, he's, he's currently at 43.1, which puts him in the fourth round for 10 person leagues and close to it for 12. Shouldn't go anywhere near that either. Um, he should be going in the second, probably, um, maybe late second. It depends on the league. You're going to have to figure that out, but his value is clearly early second ish. Uh, well, his values are higher than that, but you do have to factor in a little bit the amount of uh, time you're going to lose for him. But the fact of the matter is, if you get Pashnak on your team and it doesn't cost you a first, then you've basically got an extra first round pick. Now, in an ideal situation, like this is something that could potentially happen in novice or even intermediate leagues. Uh, you could take your whoever you want first uh, in, in the first round 
I could really see this happening with end caps, by the way, close to the end cap. Take whoever you want in the first round. Let's say it doesn't matter who the first round pick is. In the second round, you take Brad Marchand. According to the ADP, that's way ahead. Third round, you take Pashnak. And in my opinion, you've won the league. I honestly think at that point you have won the league. I don't see really how you can lose in many leagues later into the season when you have those players. Um, it's just they're, they are way yeah. undervalued I mean, you right did, now. You did get, did you get Marchand today in our draft, in our mock draft? No, I thought did. I was going to. Um, yeah, somebody else took him before me. But I mean, I thought for sure I was going to get him. I, I drafted from the seventh spot. I thought I would come back around at uh, six, seventh spot and a 12 person. I yeah. thought I'd come back around and get him in the middle of the second. But um, there's a few of you, actually, a few uh, listeners out there. And I think one of them just scooped him. Pashnak also didn't come back around in the third, which yeah. is understandable. He shouldn't, but I actually did take a lot of the people that are on my list in this mock draft, or at least targeted them. Um, so I actually, mm-hmm. I, I did, did well. see, yeah. it was kind of cool, I think, to be doing this episode now after having done a mock draft and seeing, oh, wow, you can actually get these guys and build a really good team. Um, so the, I'll mention the guys that I was targeting and very much could have gotten and maybe jumped the gun on or missed or whatever. Also, centers are really deep late. One thing I noticed, I took, I got Otto Sebastian Ajo early. Wasn't a huge fan of that um, just because I realized there was so much later on. I took a goaltender early, realized there was so much goaltender depth later. I would have liked to have taken a defenseman when I took a goaltender in the fifth round, fifth, sixth round. Um, so little things there if you didn't watch the mock draft that I picked up on. So the first one here for me is going to be a center in uh, Pierre-Luc Dubois. He was on my list last year. He's, as of the time of writing the script, he was 99.7 ADP. Uh, to me, he just had a great season last year, had a lot of opportunities. Sure, the tail end of that season saw him lose that top spot and his minutes dip. But I think at the end of the day, for Columbus to be competitive, they're going to need Pierre-Luc Dubois to show up. He is their number one setter at the moment. And for me, I see a big potential for him to click with Oliver Bjorkstrand and really increase his point totals there if they click and on the power play and at even strength. Hopefully, we'll see. There is a case... Oh, move my mic. There is a case for uh, Oliver Bjorkstrand to end up on the second line, for example, Pierre-Luc Dubois to be on the first line. But regardless, I like Pierre-Luc Dubois a lot as a little bit of a sleeper. And one of those centers late that you could pick up with some pretty good potential, I think. I, 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 I don't know. I, I think considering center depth this season. I think in a bangers league, he matters way more. In a non-bangers league where points yeah. are the biggest thing in the world, I don't think so just because, you know, I think he's capped at 65. I think we're looking at probably more of like a 60-point mm-hmm. season for him. Maybe 70 is his cap if he's just unreal. Um, but it's not like you're saying when there's other centers out there, I have a few on my list here that I like way more that potentially could get the same amount of points. Yeah. In a points league, I don't think I like PLU to ball that much as a sleeper, but in a banger league, I certainly like him a lot more because he comes with those shots and some hits as well. Yep. Um, my next one here is also on the early side. So, you know, when you call somebody that's in the 50 ADP range, a sleeper, there's only so much you can really do with that. It pretty much means draft them one round ahead of their current ADP ish. Um, and that's Taylor Hall at 53.4. Um, we saw him be very good in a not so good Detroit at Detroit in a not so good, uh, New Jersey devils situation, um, where he put up like some premier numbers that made him a first round pick the next year, which didn't really work out so well for people that did that. But, um, then we saw him go to Arizona where all offense goes to die. And unfortunately he couldn't do anything there, which nobody apparently can. Um, and now he's, he's going to be playing in Buffalo with a really promising team of, of young players around him. You know, you look at that power play, you've got now Taylor Hall, Jack Eichel and, uh, and Rasmus Dahlin. The other two pieces kind of don't even, don't even matter at that point. I think it's bad news for, yeah, for Skinner, sure. but, um, you, but yeah, without going into too much detail, um, I think Taylor Hall, if he plays really well, is a second round value guy. If he plays how I think he's going to play, he's still worth it in the third, and I'm talking about being able to take him in the fourth here. Yeah, so that's that's kind of where I'm I'm targeting him. Yeah, and I do want to say too on this episode, we're keeping it a little bit shorter, so we're not going into as much details or numbers on these guys. But rest assured, we have kind of looked at them. So if you want more details on why we like a guy as a sleeper, you can ask us in the comments on YouTube or tweet us, and we're happy to kind of explain a little bit more. Um, but just for the sake of brevity we are just kind of going over these guys and giving a little bit of a spiel on them um 
But yeah, my next one here, mm-hmm. uh, I love this guy. I got him in the mock draft. I reached a little bit, maybe two rounds early, and I think that's fine because of his ranks, given what happens when you put in his numbers, especially in a bangers league, and that's Jonathan Marcheseau. I mean, even in a points league. I, I hate his his ADP makes me like actually 122. Mad. It's insanity that he is going at 122. And even if you're in a points league, I get it. Let's say you don't really like his point totals. So what? If you're in a points league that gives you points for shots, that's a, a really consistent floor night in and night out. And I love that around the 10th round. Mm-hmm. I'll take a consistent floor from shots on goal all day. Top power play. I'll take that. Jonathan March is so should just not be too. going to 122. That is for sure. I got him today, I think, in the 10th round, 9th round, 9th, 10th round, I think, something like that. It must have been before the 10th. It was I wouldn't still just ridiculous. Far, I, I couldn't believe that he was there still for me. It, it, it felt, it, it's just ridiculous. He should have been there. He's worth a he's worth yeah. a fifth or a sixth. Yeah, for sure. Honestly, yeah. you'll be able he to get reminds me of Huberto. It's just just with later. Like Huberto, remember last year, was going like fifth or sixth, but he was worth more like a second rounder. I see the same thing with March. So where yeah. there's like a gap of about four rounds there with March. So of what he should be going at and what he yeah. actually is at. Yeah. Maybe even more like 122. That's a that's 12th crazy. round in a 10 person league. And he's probably in a 10 person, probably a six, yeah. six Nuts. round pick. It's insane. Uh, I think he's yeah. the biggest sleeper in the, like I, we can make arguments for some other guys that have high ceilings, but as far as a high floor and a high ceiling, it's he's insane. just ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> all right, moving on. My next one here is Dylan Larkin. Uh, a favorite of the podcast, as I'm sure he's got a, knows. he's got a very nice one forty two six. Great. He does. The crazy thing about Dylan Larkin is if I wound up with Dylan Larkin as my first center, I would feel decent yeah. about my team still. Uh, I think he really does have that potential. His floor is obviously kind of whatever, but with the depth that with the depth there is at center, um, there there's not really much to much to worry about. Uh, Dylan Larkin's bad season yeah. is still pretty good in a cats league. So, uh, his, his floor, although a little bit different from a traditional floor is still pretty high for, uh, for bangers leagues in points leagues. That's probably where you see a little bit of, of value issues potentially, but, yeah. um, he's going to have Anthony Manth on his wing this time, hopefully for longer than last season. And that let should me, help. His let me just put sure. this out there on Dylan Larkin, who was also on my list. Okay. Both Jonathan March. So he's 142.6. So when I plug in, MVP, when I plug in my low. rankings and I use, sheets out there that people like let's just say prominent sheets prominent projections okay people you can trust like i say which you can trust them and i plug in yahoo's standard cats okay jonathan march so is ranked 39th ignoring plus minus because i don't i don't draft with plus minus ignore that so for some people it might be different if you actually draft with that plus minus is probably I, I, actually yeah, decent i, I pretend that too, plus minus doesn't but... exist jonathan march so goes up is 39th overall on a skater basis okay dylan larkin is 49th those two, to me, are the biggest steals. I get, like Brandon said, Dylan Larkin had a bad season last year, but a healthy Mantha, full season, I I love what Dylan Larkin could do this season. I, I'm really excited, and I would take him, even at that range. Say you take him like 10th round, and he flops, and he's like last year? So what? It's It was worth the gamble. Yeah. I would take, I would take, I think Larkin is probably worth yeah, an 8th or a ninth in most leagues. If I mean, he's yeah. worth more than that, probably, but that's probably the right place to take him, um, depending on your league. I mean, if, if you think people aren't smart, yeah, then for sure. later. <laughs> My next guy here that I think is being slept on just way, way too much is a guy that actually is in the top 40 on Yahoo Standard Cats, um, per what I think their value is, and that's Travis Konechny, center right wing, 96.4 ADP. I don't really understand why Konechny is being faded from last year. I, I don't quite understand what might have happened I th- maybe people are scared of the rookies coming up and taking his spot i i don't get it he had a fantastic year great minutes great power play time on ice everything looks really good and yet why is he going so late it really doesn't make any sense to me and to me it just feels like a big steal maybe not a guy you necessarily want to reach on um that's maybe not what i'm thinking right because he reminds me a little bit of elias Lindholm a little bit i um, very similar player to me in the sense of where they could end up and everything. So I like both of them equally. I ended up getting Elias Lindholm instead of connecting. I think connecting went just a few spots ahead of Lindholm um, in our mock draft, but I had connecting queued. But again, to me, he's a guy that if you get anywhere in that range, like say once you hit that 80 ADP right there, connecting already becomes incredible value, maybe even 70 and ahead, honestly. And I think that's where you can get him. And that dual eligibility, of course, 
it's fantastic. And guys like Konechny and some of these other guys we're going to talk about and Larkin and PLD and even March or so, all these guys have center eligibility. So if you're taking centers early and you know there's all this value at the end, uh, I don't like putting a lot of emphasis on positional stuff early. But like if I'm looking at a center versus Stamkos left wing, right wing, I'm going to lean Stamkos every day now because there's so much depth at center late. Mm -hmm. So just something to keep in mind. But I really like Travis Konechny at where he's going in a round or two earlier. Right. I've got one more center here, and that's Sean Monahan at 150.1. When you get down to 150 plus, you're talking about players that sometimes aren't even Mm -hmm. drafted in some leagues. Uh, Monahan should be drafted. He's got a pretty high ceiling, a okay floor um, on a on a on a Calgary team that looks like it should be rebounding, right? Like two years ago, they were the hottest team as far as being scoring too many goals for what they should be doing. Then last year, they just went completely the opposite way, overcorrection. And now they're going to be in a division, um, that the All Canada Division, which should be a complete oh, yeah. gong show. Um, I, I can see just tons of goals being scored there. In in my head, anytime I, I I'm looking at a player in that division, I'm giving them a little bit of a boost for points uh, at, compared to their projections just because um, I, I don't really think any team in that division is good defensively, yeah. like zero. It's, it's crazy. So I think there's going to be a lot of goals scored up there. Um, and that gives me a little bit of a push for Monaghan. I actually drafted Monaghan in our, mm-hmm. in our mock yeah, draft, you did. I think. I like Monaghan a lot. I and did, this actually. happens every yeah, year. The league that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. So in I think when you look at um, bangers leagues, it makes a little bit more sense that he's faded because he doesn't really offer much except for points, to be honest. But when you look at a points league, that's where you start to say, hmm, why is Monaghan being faded so late? Even, and this is kind of crazy, even in Yahoo Standard Cats, according to this fancy sheet, he's ranked 56th overall. That's pretty dang good, right? And yet, pretty he's good. going 149.8. That is a level of disparity like Dylan Larkin. So you're looking at Dylan Larkin, Sean Monahan, you know, all these guys go, Jonathan March so all these guys go, they're late, that are centers. And I've got one more to add to that list that I like a lot that isn't necessarily. March huh. is even a center. But yeah, he's, March he's, is he's even center. a center. He, he has center, center eligibility, eligibility, but he's left So, I mean, wing. if you're drafting, right, like yeah. I'll take the center eligible guy. Sure, it still counts. Right, right, right. Yeah. Later on, if I have my wings filled, for example, and I need to fill my center spot, I'm probably looking at March so as one of those options um, or connecting or something like that, right? Mm. Another guy that is way later is not to me as high. So this guy is more of like, say, in that 90 to 100 overall range, somewhere in there, right? That's Jonathan Taze, another center that is going really late. His ADP is 147.5. A lot of people are sleeping on him too. He had a pretty good season and he still has a really good power play with Patrick Kane. Maybe they'll keep Patrick Kane and Jonathan Taze together this season. I don't know. Uh, you've got Debrin Cat. Hopefully, he can show up this year. You've got Kubalik, who I know we don't trust, but and we don't trust Debrin Cat either that much, but you never know what could happen there. There's at least pieces around him that could happen, and Taze is a good play driver. So while, yes, everyone likes to talk about Jonathan Taze being this boring player, he's just not. He is still serviceable at where he is. And this is the thing. The reason I think also Taze gets labeled a non-fantasy player or just not an exciting player for fantasy is because he doesn't get drafted because everyone takes center so early that then once you get back there, you're like, "Mm, well, I don't need a center anymore. I don't need a pure center especially. So I'm not going to take him. And then he seems super boring. But when it comes to like what you can do later, I mean, there's just so much center value. It's it, It really is quite insane what there is later in these rounds so i'd certainly this year be prioritizing defensemen and wings over these centers although as we'll talk about in a second there's a lot of really good defenseman value too so sure fade centers but don't mm-hmm. go too crazy on defensemen because we'll get into it there's a lot of really good defensemen ones um but first let's finish off uh i only have i have two more here you take another one yeah, I've got a bunch, but I think a few of them are more honorable mentions than actually need any detail. But and I think we're going to overlap on two of these as well. <clears throat> this next one, I know we're. In fact, I know we will. This next one, Anthony Mantha, one fifty-five one right now. That is really late. That is where we saw him being drafted last season. And what did we say last season? Yep. He's a sleeper. And what happened last season? He blew up, and then he actually yeah. physically blew up. So uh, you got him for a minute, and it felt great, and then <laughs> he died, and it felt worse. But he's in. 
pretty good shape. I mean, you know, he's he's going to be back on Larkin's wing. Uh, they had a really good connection while they were playing together. Um, top power play, obviously, because who else does Detroit really have? But I I, th- I have really high hopes for, yeah. for Mantha. I don't think there's a whole lot more to be said. His peripherals actually aren't bad either. So he could turn in. I actually think, like, if I'm going to take a gamble on one player to have to break out past their ADP. Or past their rank? The most. You mean? Yeah, like like... Let's say, okay, so his ADP right now is yeah. 155 one. I could see him, if he really, really has a great season, being like a top yeah, I could see that too. player. Um, so, I mean, that's that's a huge difference. Especially when you're picking a guy that late. I mean, that's just huge value. Left wing, right yeah. wing too. I love that. I mean, all those guys. And as we'll talk about, I, I picked him up in yeah. our... in our. Uh, I, I was going to get him right before you, but I really needed defense and I screwed up. Waited a little bit too long on defenseman, and I had to take a defenseman by then. So I couldn't steal Anthony Mantha from you. But yes, I agree with you. He could be like a top 30 pick. And this also gets into kind of a discussion that we talk about a lot sometimes of like, don't avoid when you're drafting. We, I think we talked about this on the draft strategy episode as well, um, which if you haven't seen, you can check that out down in the comments below. I'll, I'll put a link to it um, so you can go back and watch it if you haven't. It's a great um, companion piece to these sleeper and bust episodes and everything. One of the things that people tend to do a lot in drafts that I don't like and I see all the time is people tend to avoid bad teams. They tend to avoid the Detroits, the Ottawas, and these teams where you have guys like Anthony Mantha that are playing insane minutes are the people to have on those teams. And yet because they're on Detroit, they don't really want them. The same with Dylan Larkin. It just is what always happens. Even with Tays now with Chicago, people see Chicago now as this unsexy team that's in a rebuild. No one wants to really touch them. And so this tends to happen a lot. We see this every year where people will reach for like the third liner on Tampa Bay because they want to touch nice things. and They want to touch this championship team. But then they're ignoring these top line, big minute crunching guys on these bad teams, which hold a lot of value. So definitely don't sleep on these bad teams that are just being forgotten about. They're really important and can drive a lot. And some of my, a lot of my defensemen are actually just exact points for this, where people are sleeping on them, in my opinion, a little bit too much because they're on bad teams. But before we get into that, I think one of my big ones here, just as a, like a, I don't know if I really like him. I don't like him in points. I like him in bangers leagues, and that's Jamie Benn at 140. I think he has a lot of potential to rebound, at least rebound to be serviceable. I don't think mm-hmm. he's going to rebound to be the greatest player, but I mean, compared to last year when he was going, I think around third or fourth round um, and now falling, you know, all the way to 140, I think it's way too big of a drop for him. I think he should be going a little bit more around the hundreds or something like that, you know, 10th round in a 10 person, um, especially in a bangers league. He still has a lot to offer and a lot of upside there. So to me, I he's a good gamble that has pedigree and someone that honestly at the very least, you could probably trade for someone who's kind of hot and you notice, oh, they're they're young and doing well, and then move him just because of name value alone. And I don't I don't mind taking flyers sometimes on guys that have name value and you just kind of know you'll probably be able to trade them away later. Yep. I actually like yeah. Ben quite a bit this season. Um my next one here is Nikolai Ehlers, 161.7. Another one I really don't understand. I'm very confused by him being this low rated. The only thing, the only real knock against against Ehlers is his lack of yeah. power play points. Um, and I've, I've said this kind of off air a handful of times, but he's one injury or one COVID sickness or one trade, right? Anything away from being in that top power play line. If he gets top power play, he's going to be nearly a point per game player. Uh, if you just add like, you know, he gets typically six to eight power play points a season or something like that. You put him in line with how good that power play is. And just add another, like, he should at least triple that, I would think, be in the 20s somewhere. And you add that to his overall points total, and you're looking at nearly a point-per-game player that has pretty good peripherals, especially in the Shaw's department. Um, he's way too low. Even if I knew he wasn't going to get top power play, I would have him by then. Yep. My last guy here is not so much a reach for. Uh, it's more of a gamble on this guy, and you might have a gem. I could see him being what you expect from Anthony Mantha at his best maybe a little bit uh just to, no I'd say about you know that 65 to 70 overall kind of position in the league that's Brian Rust going 155 right now but he's a big question mark because it's all going to come down to deployment what is he going to do what is Pittsburgh going to do with him do they put him on the top power play do they not well they don't have Hornquist anymore so that kind of helps him 
um, even though he does play a bit of a different role than Hornquist to an extent. So it's going yeah, to be him versus so Zucker, really interesting much. to see what happens there. But if Zucker can get that top power play and be on Malkin's wing, you mean Rust? Whew, watch out because that 155 is going to be a steal. Th- there's an interesting idea here. Um, as Zucker is very low uh, or basically undrafted as well, of taking Rust and Zucker and keeping yeah. whichever one stays. I like that move a lot, especially play. so early um, in the season, like with your last pick, right? You can get you can get a guy like Rust. I think Rust went in the 15th round, so second to last in our mock draft, something, something like that. that. So yeah. he's going really, really late. One of my favorite just kind of late grabs that at very least you're dumping, but the upside is enormous given what Pittsburgh can do on the power play and what he can even do at even strength if he has a guy like Malkin centering him, right? Or even Crosby. But he, I don't think he's ever played with Crosby. I think he's always played with Malkin. So the expectation would be that he plays with Malkin. But of course, it all comes down to deployment, so yep. something to watch. Um, okay, you have a few more, right, that are just honorable mentions that you need to run through, and then we can move on to defensemen? Uh, one is okay. not an honorable mention, then I have a couple that are. Um, my last major one here is Oliver Bjorkstrand oh, at 173.7. Yeah, Left the best yeah. for last. Um, he's got like Mantha like major upside. Um, we saw him start to break out last season. Uh, I think that could continue this season. I think he's worth any anywhere past like the maybe the eleventh round, maybe even anywhere in the double digits. Really, if he fits your comp, he's worth he's worth taking a shot at, especially in, in oh, yeah. leagues that give uh, either cats leagues with shots or uh, points leagues that give a, a yeah. decent bonus of shots. He's he's got some upside there. I probably would take him personally, maybe twelfth yeah. or later. Twelfth seems to be the 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 number that pops out in my head, which is still well. He played like seventeen minutes a game last season. He was clearly trusted, and I think he'll continue to be trusted this year. Yeah, and he was shooting a lot, shooting I think a ton. Brandon and I have said this. Love that offline they need somebody too. Like him too, like if if you're talking about who's the Columbus goal scorer, no. it's it's either him or Atkinson, and I think that Bjorkstrand is turning into who yes, Atkinson. Who everyone is supposed thought to be, he'd be, or people who people think yeah. Atkinson is. I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. You take on your honorable mentions, then we'll move into defensemen sleepers. Yep. I'm actually Ooh. adding one here because this made me think about it. But first one is Tyler Toffoli, 177.7. I took him in our mm-hmm. in our mock draft as well. Um, broke out, you know, after leaving the after leaving LA in Vancouver. Now we're seeing him over in Montreal. It, hopefully he gets top power play or at least gets good minutes. Um, he's gonna get decent deployment, so he could continue the process, but Montreal maybe he scares sucks. Me. who knows. So decent late round. Montreal scares me. What's that? Just because we saw last year so many people break out yeah. and have these opportunities, I don't think they actually have like set in stone things people do. Like aside from Brad and Gallagher, everyone feels yeah. like it's kind of like a okay, whoever's yeah. hot, everyone whoever it is gets the opportunity to shine. Yeah. So it kind of scares me, but again, a good late flyer. Yeah, I think I think of yeah. Tatar in the same way. I feel like to Foley and Tatar. Tatar, to no, to Foley. Um, they're all similar. To no, I, I never really trust, but yeah, the rest of them. Um, okay. Next one is Ricky racks here at 183.7. Uh, he's just a gamble. Like we've seen upside from him before. He's kind of the guy that, that, um, Anaheim needs to step up if anybody's going to right now. Uh, he, he, he's turning 27 this season or he already is. So it's really the time to either make it or break it for him. Uh, not necessarily something you need to hang on to all season, but somebody to take a look at, especially considering Anaheim doesn't have the off nights. Otherwise you'd have a bit more of a bonus. And the last one, well, the second last one is Anthony Beauvillier. He's got no ADP, but he saw some breakout time on the island uh, at the end of last season and in the playoffs. Uh, worth a like literal last round grab or very late round stab at him if there's nobody better around. Um, at the very least, keep him on your watch list, I think. And my last one, and this made me think of it because you mentioned Jamie Benn. When did Rope Hints really start hmm. breaking out? The, the time when he, when everybody like got you know starry eyes looking at him. It's when he got the top center position and top power play. Sagan's out until like April. Um, this could be a really good year to once again take a stab at Rope Hints in the last round or the 16th round or something. Uh, he's going to get the best deployment he can possibly get, uh, and he's got the opportunity to step up again. So interesting late round I stab like with that, him as well. Actually. I hadn't thought of that. It also makes me think, like I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but something I'd said on the mock draft, I don't know if it, I don't know if it, well, maybe I said it while we were recording. I don't remember. Um, but Stamkos, to me, is a little bit of a steal. I think with the with Kucherov missing the season, I think Stamkos yeah. and his left-wing, right-wing eligibility moves up to a first-round pick. We saw him go late in the second, I think. Um, no, you got him middle of the second. Yeah. 
So Brandon him. took him middle of the middle second, second yeah. um, because I autoed. I was going to take him right at the beginning of the second, uh, but that's kind of where I see him going now is up there. Not that the, I think right now he's like 24 or something like that ADP. So end of the yeah. second might be, uh, might be a little that. bit higher. So I would want him like, you know, first or second round. I mean, if we're willing to take Kucherov that early, hell, I'm looking at who's the guy now. It's Stammer. So just someone to mention there. Okay, let's move on to our defenseman now. Uh, we'll kind of run through these. I don't think there's a lot to say on the defenseman um, too much. But my first one here is going to be Rasmus Dahlin, 75.2. One of the things I try to target anytime I'm looking at defensemen is top power play. That is the number one thing I'm looking at. Otherwise, it's peripherals, right? Those are the two things. Otherwise, defensemen don't really get points, even strength that much. You're looking mostly at a top power play deployment. And more than anything, you want a guy who's going to be a surefire top power play guy. Rasmus Dahlin is that guy. At the very worst, he is a Keith Yandel power play specialist, and that's it. But quite frankly, for where he's going, that's pretty good. If you look at like who goes right above him, right? You've got the Morgan Rileys, and you've got the Ducky Hamiltons and all this. If you're able to sit that out and your constellation prize is Rasmus Dahlin, you're doing okay if what you're going for. Like, I'd rather have Dahlin than Krug. Just from a value perspective, yeah, I would, I would want him over Krug. I'd want him over Petrangelo or Shea Theodore, just from a points perspective. Forget about uh, peripherals for a second. Like, because if you're doing it for peripherals, that's different. But if you're looking for a defenseman that just gets you points, I I love that. Um, and so 75.2 feels like a little bit of a, a little bit of a steal there, given who else goes ahead of him. All right, my first defenseman. Actually, I'm going to give an honorable okay. mention before I get into it to Brent Burns. Brent Burns who's going in like mm-hmm. the fourth round or late fourth. I got him in our mock draft. He just yeah. feels like very good value. I got him in the fourth round in our mock draft, in a, in a draft with a bunch of good people in it. So that feels like a place you can get him. Um, upside's very yeah. high. The floor's decent. So anyway, Charlie McAvoy is my first true sleeper here at 109.9. He's a player that showed up on my bust list basically every season prior to this one because. For some reason, people would draft him despite the fact that like he's not going to get power play points. And in most leagues, uh, you need to be able to get power play points from your defenseman because it's hard to get much else from them that that translate into points. So this season, with Krug being moved off, uh, it's either going to be him or, or Matt Grizzlick at the top power play position. Now, we have seen Grizzlick there before, but I think this is the season they need to be able to rely on Charlie McAvoy. Yeah. And... Um, if he gets that top power play position to add to his, this is similar similar situation as Nikolai Ehlers, except I think the likelihood yeah. is much higher. Um, you could see him be, I literally think he could, he could wind up being a top five mm-hmm. defenseman this season. Uh, if he gets that top power, in fact, I would say right now, if you told me for sure he would get the top power play spot, I would call him a top five defenseman. I would, I would just assume it would happen. So I, I'm really high on Charlie McAvoy. I grabbed him and our mocked as well. Uh, the floor is kind of sucks, but at least he puts up, uh, decent peripherals if you're in a cat's league, uh, except for shots and the upside is enormous. So that one Oh nine, nine is crazy. I, I think I took him in like the seventh or eighth round. So I've got another, um, <laughs> this one you're going to think is a little crazy maybe, but I have another guy here at 94.8 that I think could be a top five defenseman as well. If all goes right. Neil Pionk. I think he could mm-hmm. be a top five defenseman yep. easily if all things go right. If he gets top power play all season, it's top deployment all season, given peripherals in a Yahoo standard Cats league, I think he can become a top five defenseman at 94.8. Especially in yeah. that league. I mean, I talked about it earlier, but... Especially in that goals, Canadian division. I, I mean, and you're on a team that knows how to score on the power play. Defensemen are involved. When we, we saw Dustin Bufflin get involved. Hell, even when Josh Morrissey was up there, he was getting involved. So the defensemen get involved in the way they cycle the puck on the power play, which is great for him, and he is good on the power play. So to me, again, I'm going to you know keep harping on this, but as you look at these really late rounds, there's some defensemen that are really good and that are going to be getting top power play deployment late. And so... When I did my draft today, for example, I found it very, I could have found it very easy to have taken, say, of Roman Yossi or someone like that. Fine. I miss out on, you know, I, I miss out on a forward, but there's so many good centers, right? Like, say, I'm sacrificing that for a top center there. Fine. I take that. And then later on, there's all these options like Pionk, Dahlin, or you have McAvoy or some of these other guys I'm going to talk about. There are really good options out there on defense. I do like the idea this year of getting one of the top defensemen, one of the quote-unquote secure defenseman whether that's riley or yossi or hamilton or headman or whatever there do seem to be yeah. more of them so those are the safe ones i'd say so i would like to do a safe one 
two on more riskier plays, so like the Pionk or the McAvoy or some of these other guys, and you'll be in a really good spot on defense and not really be sacrificing anything. You know, you won't be stretching to fill those holes. <laughs> yep. My next one, I'm getting deep now, is uh, Duncan Keith at 165.4. Yeah. Uh, that late, you know, we're talking about the 160s, very likely undrafted in a lot of leagues. Um, we saw him do very well at the end of last season. Not so good in the playoffs, but whatever. Uh, and that's because he got top power play. He started shooting a lot again. He got, uh, I mean, I've picked him up in several leagues during this time. And uh, he's got decent peripherals as well to go with it, especially in the blocks category. So Duncan Keith, that late, um, feels like a steal to me. I mean, he's probably not an all-season guy, but if he starts out the season on top power play, I'm probably going to have him as long as he's on top power play with exposure to guys like Patrick Kane, Dominic Kubelik, who just seems to be getting better and better. Um, and I guess that's it. But <laughs> I do like him. <laughs> Patrick Kane's enough. Let's just call it Patrick Kane. I think because, I mean, to on that point, one guy that you immediately want to place on your watch list if you draft um, Duncan Keith, and actually you just want to place on your watch list in general, is going to be Adam Boquist on Chicago. He could easily take yep. over that top power play slot from Duncan Keith as a rookie. Yep. Um, okay, my next one here is going to be on the Ottawa Senators, Thomas Chabot, 108.8. Again, just one of those guys that I got in my draft. I was in a pickle for defenseman. Thomas Chabot came to save me. And he still is ranked pretty damn well. He's going way too late. Um, he's a top power play guy. Had a good season last year. A little bit underwhelming. But overall, I think a good season, especially for a sophomore season. Um, so I think he can be a lot better this year. And I like him a lot. Yep. I've got one last one. And this is more of an honorable mention late round. Like, again, this is one of the guys that I would, in the Ricky Rack style that I would take probably in the last round or the second to last round, depending on what my comp is. Uh, and that's Jacob mm -hmm. Chikrin, 174.4. If you've been listening to this podcast for long enough, I feel like I talk about him every few weeks for some reason, even though he's never really warranted this much attention. I just... I have this feeling that we're going to see him take over top power play from OEL. Yeah. Um, we saw him split time with OEL. We saw him uh, then play two defensemen up there. I think that this season, we may see him actually be able to get to play top power play in Arizona. Um, unfortunately, I still don't know what that means because Arizona is such a weird team that it may not be great anyway, but he's a decent peripheral guy to go with everything else. And if his points start coming in, we can start to see him forming himself in the Neil Pionk style yeah. of, of defenseman, which would be nice. But it, that's yeah. asking a lot of Arizona, I suppose. So that's why he's a, yeah, a that's, last round That's kind of why, that's why I wouldn't. I'm not as excited. I love Chikrin's situation and his where he's at. The problem is I don't really like where he's literally at on the team in Arizona because they just don't score points. Yeah. And there's not that many goals to get in on to begin with. Yep. I have two more here, and then I'll let you go into goaltenders. Um, Drew Doughty, 132.1. I ended up getting him today. Great banger league option. Top mm -hmm. power play for now. But again, yep. one of those guys that you can easily drop later if he becomes not worth it. I think, uh, especially in that division, LA can be competitive, semi-competitive at least. I think Drew Doughty still has a lot to offer in fantasy world at least. Maybe not so much in the real world. Um, but in the fantasy world, he for sure has a lot to offer still, especially in like a standard Cats Yahoo League. If Drew Doughty ends up being your third defenseman, fourth defenseman, you're doing really okay. So that's kind of how I'm viewing it. It's like if I'm getting Drew Doughty as my third or fourth defenseman, I am doing really well. Um, that's kind of what I was saying before was I like the idea of, say, a top defenseman and Yossi, Dougie Hamilton, whatever, maybe back to back with Pionk and Jabot. You wait a while and then you can get Drew Doughty as well. You're doing pretty good. Um, and then my last one here is a very honorable mention. He's going 181.6 is Ben Chirot. Really good bangers league option. That's the only reason. If say you are late in your draft and you noticed, oh man, I have no hits. I have no blocks. I'm doing really poorly in the peripherals department in the Cats League, especially. Chirot's your guy. On top of that, Chirot is also a really interesting deep, deep league uh, points option. Because if you're in a deep points league, you're looking for consistency late. That's what you kind of want. You do want the risks, sure. But you're also looking for who's going to get me consistent points night in, night out. And that's Ben Chirot with his peripherals if you give points for those hits and blocks. Yep. I, I've got Sherrod in uh, yeah. our Dynasty League. And I had him in a Didn't bunch I of leagues trade him last to you? season for cats. I did trade him to you. Yeah. And now I'm mentioning him as a sleeper. You did. Well done, Gamby. Well done. Yep. Okay, let's move into our goaltender sleepers and round this episode out. 
So my first one here, and this depends on your league to an extent, is mm-hmm. John Gibson at 148.9. Um, the situation I think with Gibson is I do think we're going to see him mm-hmm. return to form a bit. Uh, he's been behind a bad team basically his entire career, unfortunately for him. But uh, just with the exception of last season, he's always been able to perform regardless. I think what we're going to see from him is like meh win numbers, good saves, decent save percentage, and like yep. meh goal against average. So this late, you're getting like what I hope is going to be an above average goaltending performance, even uh, with a little bit of Let's... upside there. Uh, at 148.9, like that's really, really late considering we've seen him go in like the sixth rounds, even before that prior. Even I got to say, I heavily team. disagree with the fact that we're going to see an above average goaltender performance. I think we're going to see an above expected goaltender performance for him. I don't think we're going to see an, an above league average performance i think we'll see right at about league average and that's still amazing for the situation he's i in. think his safe percentage is going to be better than league average okay I'll say that i mean much. and if that is then and i think he's gonna get a workload which is gonna be that's the hardest thing to find this late is is a goal it's gonna get a lot of workload yeah i, um, I agree with the volume like for example that. in our league i plugged his numbers yeah. into um our league settings with the tool he was seventh overall for our league settings which are win save percentage and saves so that's a really volume heavy league so as a compliment to a lot of other things, just from a saves percentage perspective alone. Yeah. They must like a save percentage, I mean, though. What's, what's his projected um, save percentage? Let me see if, if I can pull him. that up really quick. Um, Where do I have that? In yes. the meantime, I can talk about Semyon Varlamov for a second. Why are we doing know. this again? Again, always. Uh, I said this last season that 153.3 is too late for Varlamov. It still is. I mean, we're probably talking about a split start goaltender here, but we're, he's still behind the same New York Islander defense that is very annoying to deal with. Keep shots to the outside, make it very easy for the goaltender. Um, I think a very viable strategy in leagues that are typical Yahoo leagues, win, save percentage, goal against average shutouts. Take Varlamov and Sorokin, and you're yeah. in great shape. Maybe an, add an extra goalie if you need it for certain matchups, but I mean, those are two guys you can get literally at the end of the draft and not have to worry about goalies for the entire draft. Yeah, I'm I'm struggling to pull up Dom's projections on on it real quick, but whatever. Anyways, it's got to be a little bit high. So I'm going to move into my first one, which is UC Saros, 116.2. Uh, given the guys that are he's going around and the guys that go ahead of him, I think he's should be in that conversation like towards the Bennington side more versus like what he's actually going towards right uh, at the moment, which I think is more like the Merzlikens and that sort of area. And even the Bobrovsky, I think he's a little bit better than that. I think the Nashville team is still really competitive. I think they can be really competitive in the division they're in. And on top of that, I think last year, especially in the playoffs, we saw Saro cement himself as the number one goalie, in my opinion. I mean, he had the performances to back it up. If you go back and watch those playoffs, Saros is the reason Nashville does not get eliminated earlier. He's he's the entire reason. Saros was incredible last season. Yeah. Um, last season and in the playoffs, I think he is going to be the number one guy in Nashville. And if you don't trust that, it's not hard to do the tandem of Saros and Pecorino because Pecorino is going... I think two rounds behind him or something like that. So you can do that tandem if you really want to, but I really like UC Saros this season. And I like him even as a situation where maybe he's your goalie one. I don't hate that. I don't hate UC Saros being your goalie one this season. And Gibson, of course, was also on my list. And before we go into your last ones here, there's, of course, one goaltender mm-hmm. I must put on my sleeper list or else, quite frankly, we wouldn't God. be the Fantasy Hockey Podcast. At 119.7. Come on down, Sergei Bobrovsky. Mm-hmm. He's a sleeper this year. Because at worst, mm-hmm. at 119.7, Sergei Bobrovsky is at worst a guy you drop. Fine. Here's the thing with Sergei Bobrovsky to me. He has the widest range maybe of all the goaltenders this year in terms of his ceiling and his floor. His floor, I think, is atrocious. Just terrible. Whereas his ceiling is insanely high and quite frankly i think personally i think i trust bobrovsky more in a shortened season than i do an extended season i think yeah that could be and on top of that they have the new goalie excellence department which has worked really well i forgot what other team did it there was another team that did it i think it was arizona actually oh yeah arizona did the um goaltending excellence and look what's happening there look at darcy kemper look at um auntie ranta look at Deming even who was there and crushed that's working for them Maybe this works for Florida and gets Bobrovsky back on track. But to me, I will all day try to gamble at 119.7 on a Vezina caliber goalie who, to me, has shown me one bad season on Florida. 
okay, with granted a very terrible defensive structure. Two bad one. seasons. Is it two? I think it's one. <laughs> Back to back. He played Columbus badly on his in, last season in, on the Blue Jackets oh. the year before that. Okay, that season doesn't count though. We're not counting that <laughs> last season. We're only focusing on last. He had one bad season. Yeah. Okay, just one, just one. It's okay. But my point, <laughs> my point stands that like he still can get. <laughs> he's not that old. Damn it, Bobrovsky. Oh, at least. At least I'm not saying first round this year. But anyways, I think he has the potential to actually be pretty good this season and be at least worth a pick at 19.7 compared to other goaltenders around there. So well, that's that's my last one. That is my last sleeper. And I think it's pretty fitting for me to finish on Bobrovsky and quite frankly forget that he's had two past season, two bad seasons. Because <sighs> that's just... Uh... Okay. Well, I've got two more. Um, my first one here is Miko Koskinen at 175.3. Uh, I, yeah, I really do think that's a, that's good value. Again, I do think that that's, that the Canadian division is going to be kind of crazy, but if you're in a league, especially a points league, oh, yeah. I think he's pretty valuable in a points league, uh, a league that, that gives you a lot for wins, for example. Volume. Um, I actually think I, I could see a scenario where Edmonton is second at, oh, yeah. at the end of the season. In the Canadian division. I mean, it'd be a little bit of a weird one, but yeah, in the too. Canadian division. Yeah. I would think it like I don't think it's a high chance, but I think I it's think a chance. chance. I think it's yeah, know, twenty to thirty percent. I mean, imagine if they like all click, if everything kind of first, Yamamoto but... works, if their top power yeah. play clicks, if Tyson Berry clicks. Like imagine what remember what Tyson Berry did with Colorado when he was the guy, he was good and he made that power play better. I think mm-hmm. he can do that again on Edmonton, yep. perhaps. I think yep. they can get better. So Koskinen, he, he's one of my yeah. favorite late round grabs here for goalies. And then my last one here is Mackenzie Blackwood, sort of the opposite. You're probably mm-hmm. not going to get any wins, but you're going to get like an average goaltender really late, which is hard to find. And he's probably going to get uh, a very yeah. high amount of starts. Again, volume, very difficult to find that late. Koskinen, probably not going to get you a ton of volume, but then again, Mike Smith is his backup. So I think what we saw last season was when a player, when one of them was doing well, they would tend to yep. continue to play a lot. So I think we might see that again this yep. season. And that's it. Well, there is, there That's are it. your sleepers. If you have any more, I, I, we'd actually love to hear about them. If you've seen any good value, maybe let us know where these guys are getting taken. Or if you draft these guys, we actually love when people send us pictures of their teams and we see that like six of our sleepers are on their teams and they got them super late. I love mm-hmm. seeing that. That makes me so happy when someone sends me Dylan Larkin at 120 and they're like, thanks for letting me know about him. Or they send us March at exactly like, you know, 100 or 110 or whatever. It makes us so happy to see that you drafted those guys there. So definitely let us know if you end up taking any of these guys or if you disagree with us, I guess, as well. Or if you're as excited as we are for some of these guys. Um, the next episode here coming up is going to be your fantasy hockey busts, which is always really contentious. So keep an eye out for that. That should be coming out tomorrow. Oh, yeah. And uh, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the podcast or to the YouTube channel, however you're watching and listening to this. And if you're listening to us, uh, be sure to, if if you're watching this on YouTube, a thumbs up helps. If you're listening on the podcast, leaving a review really helps. So wherever you're listening, if it's Apple Podcasts or Google or wherever, Spotify sometimes I don't think has reviews. But if you're on a place that has reviews, leaving a review would really help. If you made it this far, thank you so much. We will catch you for the bust episode. Thanks for listening. Yep, thanks for listening.